Hello everyone and welcome back to Meeting in the Flesh. Last time we were here, uh, we did Yitzal's route. Uh, did not expect to be eaten, but I'm glad we got that out of the way. But now I'm curious, because I was really, uh, I was really confident that it was going to be Nyarg that did that. And now I'm just like, what are, what are the other two going to do to us? <laughs> this world is weird. And I'm, I never want to be isekai into it. <laughs> Apologize and get going. It's too bad, but I don't want to risk delaying anyone's delivery. Sorry, it's all, but I've got a pretty busy route today. I can't talk right now, but would it be alright if I came back to talk to you later in the evening after I'm done? Yitzal's expression remains a perfect picture of calm. For a moment, I think I see his eyelids lower, his gaze flickering off to the side. But any trace of discomfort dissipates in an instant. Maybe it was just a trick of the light. No, it's alright. He smiles. He has a nice smile. It wasn't anything important, and you should rest up after your route. You do run an awful lot. Sorry again. You don't have anything to apologize for. I finish tying my bundle back together and straighten up, adjusting the way its weight sits on my back. I'll be heading off, okay? Stay safe. You too. Don't work yourself too hard, alright? It's all smiles. It's a very kind smile. Oh, man. I I didn't really look at his face. His, um, his mandibles do show. I'll be careful. I wave as I open the door and slip out. I don't have the time to dawdle, so I immediately transition from a walk to a jog then to a steady trot. But when I cast a glance back up at the overlook spire, the eyeballs on it have already started to blink into action, weeping a few tears to moisturize themselves before casting about quickly, no doubt seeking out troublemakers to put a halt to or people who might need help. I give the spire a wave of the arm right before I turn the corner, but I can't be sure if it's all would have seen it. You're on your route, right? Yeah. I'll run with you. The thanks? He's never done this before. Still, it's not like I mind the company, and Bratton is in fantastic shape even as I run at a steady jog. He keeps up with me just by walking quickly. See, I found something really interesting last night. So that's why he was waiting for me. He must have been really excited to tell someone. What was it? I'm not sure. Huh? But I'm doing my best to figure it out. That sounds difficult. Breton looks around before he continues speaking like he's making sure nobody else is around. Visibility is poor in the park anyway, so even if someone were to were eavesdropping, I'm not sure if he'd be able to spot them. He got that little snoot. He can smell them. Oh, is his tongue out? That's so cute. <laughs> Nevertheless, he looks satisfied that we're alone and continues. He's so excited that his voice is starting to get gravelly at the edges like he's fighting back the urge to start barking. <laughs> I think it's really important, you know? I've never seen anything like it before. And I think it could change things. If it's what I think it might be, then this might be huge. I might go down in history as someone incredible. So I'm really excited to figure out more about it. He's so enthusiastic that it's infectious. I can't help smiling as I nod. I don't know about exploring, but I hope it's something great. You're always working really hard, and, it's, and it'd be nice if people got a chance to really appreciate all the work you put into your job. Breton beams, showing all of his teeth. We jog along in silence for a few moments. By the way, did you put in any order for any salt today? Breton looks... A little like he was startled out of his thoughts by that, his fur puffed out a little larger than usual. Oh yeah, yeah I did. Would you like it now? Sure. I slow to a walk so I can fumble with my pack, carefully extracting one of the salt packets without dropping any of the others. I want to show you something. He's so excited he's drooling slightly, a thin string of spittle hanging from his jaw. It must be his discovery from the other day. 
well... I glance up. The sky still peaks bright past the canopy of gnarled branches and muddy leaves. I'm not terribly late, so I suppose I could spare a few minutes, but it would also mean I'd... But it would also mean I'd have to hurry with the rest of my route, which I don't like doing on principle. Still, when I look back to Bratton, his tail isn't wagging. I can't see it, so it must be standing straight at attention behind his back, which is rare. This might be something pretty important to him, so I can't answer lightly. What should I do? Make the quick trip. I think it would be best if I gave Bratton's big discovery a chance. Alright, let's go. I give Bratton the best smile I can. I'm not used to changing my routine like this, but maybe all that talk about the eclipse is getting to me. Bratton, unsurprisingly, looks ecstatic. His tail wagging so hard it's whipping at the bramble branches on either side of him. Awesome! His voice practi practically edges into a howl. It's like he can't hide his excitement. His paw easily engulfs my hand when he snatches it up. The pad's warm and a little squishy against my palm. Here, this way. I'll hurry so you won't be late on your route. The paths in the park can be pretty cramped at points, but that's not a worry when Bratton's leading the way. His giant bolt conveniently crashes through any branches hanging in the way, whipping them aside and clearing a comfortable path for me. A few leaves are getting stuck in his fur, but he doesn't even seem to notice. He's either humming or growling under his breath, possibly both. My ride's right over there. Wah. <laughs> Caterpillar. Bratton's brought us to a side entrance to the park. The street's laid out before us, and as promised, his ride waits just a few paces away, roped to a, pro to a portion of the fence and clothes to discourage any would-be thieves. You know, I didn't think about what their transport would be. I didn't even assume that they use normal cars. I just thought they walked places, like... I mean, it's the apocalypse. <laughs> I didn't think that there would be even bigger monsters around. It's a giant caterpillar. Whoa, I knew you guys got rides, but I've never seen one before. She's real nice, isn't she? It raises its head when Bratton approaches, butting its eye eyeless face into its into his paw. It's a, it has eyes. It's little beady eyes, but it has eyes. Its innards stir beneath the translucent stretch of its outer layer, swirls of color pulsing slowly. Of course. Bratton doesn't hesitate to swing a leg over the caterpillar's girth, straddling what must be its upper back and holding onto its harness, then pats the spot right behind him. Is that really comfortable, dude? You ain't got no pants on. Here, take a seat. Don't worry. She's real tame, doesn't mind other riders. I've never ridden one of these before. The caterpillar seems to glance at me when I approach, her body throbbing beneath the touch of my hand. Getting on is a little daunting, admittedly. Get on fearlessly. Get on cautiously. Uh, cautiously? What if I fall off and embarrass myself? So I can't help being a little careful, especially if this is our first time getting on it. I gingerly sit side saddle first, slowly moving slowly to avoid startling the caterpillar. Her skin shifts and gives beneath my weight, pliable and warm to touch. It feels a bit like sitting on a large, warm sack of sand. It's only after the caterpillar settled back down that I swing my other leg over and steady myself. The caterpillar gives me what might be a curious glance before looking ahead. It's alright, there's nothing to be scared of. Breton grins as he gives me a reassuring rub to the back. You ready? Yep. Hold on to me, we're gonna go fast. I don't think I've seen a caterpillar move fast before. As soon as I lean forward and wrap my arms around Bratton's waist, he gives a caterpillar a hearty smack to the side. Let's go! The caterpillar promptly starts to crawl forward at an astounding rate. I'd heard that these animals could move quickly, but she's much faster than I anticipated. I can feel the pulse of innards beneath me, the taut skin 
stretch of skin shifting and pulsing rhythmically beneath my legs as a caterpillar stretches its front half forward, then bunching up as its back half follows. Its three pairs of front legs kick up dirt with each step, its back legs popping off the ground one by one. The ride isn't terribly smooth, lurching us forward in bursts as, as opposed to gliding forward, but it's still an interesting experience. A large lunge forward almost pulls me off balance, and I hold onto Bratton a little tighter. His fur is warm beneath me, smelling faintly of soap and leaves. I can feel it through his back when he, when he inhales deeply, then exhales in a large huff. He sounds pleased. Don't worry, it's not that far off. His voice rumbles over the whipping of the wind, and I nod against his back. Oh, oh, it's hairy. Oh, ew. <laughs> What part of skin is this? The caterpillar moves swiftly, and it's not long before we're past the boundaries of the city and into the flesh fields outside. The air here feels musty or slightly damp and smelling of sweat. All around me, there's a strange warmth emanating from the ground because, you know, it's skin. The atmosphere feels somehow oppressive, like the feeling of someone breathing a little too close to your face, and I accidentally take in a deep breath but end up coughing. Yeah, I try not to breathe too deeply. It takes a little time to get used to. Whoa, we're seeing him from the front. Or rather, we're seeing his face from the front. Breton laughs briefly before ducking down low. He seems to be directing the caterpillar, petting its side to point, point it in a specific direction. I'm always replacing words in my head. I hate it. It veers gently left, lurching past a clump of scraggly hair poking out of the ground and circling around a pit brimming with liquefied fat. Oh my god, this world is just made of meat. Jesus. <laughs> meat and skin. Is it far? Considering that they, they eat flesh, do you think, like, if they're starving, like, they're traveling out and they're starving, they eat the ground? Or is that weird? The caterpillar's weight is just enough to sink into the fleshy ground, sending gentle ripples across the surface of the fat pool. The oily sheen on its surface shimmers and glows in the afternoon light, simultaneously beautiful and gross. <laughs> We're almost there. The caterpillar slows down when Bratton pats at its head, weaving in between small craters of murky liquid and clumps of bristling hair. Small clusters of insects flee before the caterpillar's bulk, scattering to hide inside widened pores or underneath the occasional chunk of bone that dots the landscape. Bratton has his head raised to sniff deeply at the air as if searching for something, for something, ears perking up suddenly. Oh my god, I could not. If I was thrown into this world, I could not. I would fear. I would fear being eaten. I would fear what I had to eat, because it's only salt. <laughs> I just remembered that it's salt. But, like, they occasionally, like, mix it in with, like, flesh and blood, so it's still... So I'd be afraid to be turned into salt. Or, like, become a part of salt. And I'm afraid that I'd just be straight up eaten. And then I'm afraid of the outside world because it's so fleshy and gross. And I just... I would lock myself away somewhere. <laughs> I couldn't. I just could not. Are you looking for something? Yeah, and just making sure there's nobody else around. We're here, though. Breton guides the caterpillar around a giant hunk of bone, nudging the caterpillar back on the right on the right track when it's briefly distracted by a porous chunk of bone marrow and dismounts to muscle his way through a chest-high patch of thick, scraggly hair. He's giving me no indication of what I should do, but I guess I should follow him? Uh, uh hurry after him. No sense in waiting, I'll catch up to him quickly. I hop off the caterpillar's back but end up stumbling one, two steps when the ground buckles slightly. The skin is warm beneath my feet, stretchy and a little jiggly f from an underlayer of fat, and I can feel my balance wobbling. Walking is a little difficult, like traversing shifting sand. 
Breton really is incredible. It takes me a few more steps to get used to the terrain, but I've largely reg regained my balance by the time I reach that thicket of hair. It's tougher than it looks, so parts of it clumped and matted together, and I need to use a little muscle to try and pry it apart. Here, let me give you a hand. Breton's paw suddenly emerges from the other side of that curtain of hair, parting it aside to allow me through. He gives me a toothy grin. Not bad, though. The hair gave me trouble, too, when I first found the spot. Thanks, but I think I'll still leave any heavy lifting to you. Is the world alive? I mean, that tower is alive. So does that mean, like, the world is, too? Ugh. Past that thicket of hair, I immediately realize what it is that Bratton wanted to show me. It's a giant hole. The flesh fields are dotted with holes, of course, pores that gently open and close as the land breathes, craters with visible pockets of flesh inside, or deep pits full of pus and grease. This one feels different, though. At first glance, the hole appears to hold a slice of the sky. It's only when the surrounding skin shifts from a slow exhale, and I think it is alive, <laughs> and the surface ripples that I realize it's a mere slick pool of fluids. Crouching down nearby, I squint down at the edges where flecks of the fluid have lapped up onto the ground. It's a deep red rich. There's a metallic smell to it, but it's not the rich stench of blood, more the smell of something foreign, something that sends shivers down my spine. It's not fear, though. I think it's anticipation. It's gorgeous, isn't it? Retton speaks breathlessly, like he's looking at a mind-shattering vista. I can't quite emphasize with that level of awe, but I nod along anyway. It certainly is strange and unique. I feel like I'm witnessing something very special. What exactly is it? We're not sure. He says it like it's a good thing. The pool surface judders when Bratton eases himself to his knees, the ground beneath him shifting with what feels like a gentle sigh. I also crouch down beside him, watching my reflection distort and warp. We found it a while looking for a new salt pool, you see. Bratton starts explaining his thoughtful expression, mitigating only slightly by the excited glint of sharp teeth. Though there's an undeniable gravity to the situation, he can't seem to contain his anticipation. At me, scared that there's just gonna be more being eaten. <laughs> Three of them had been exploring together when they found the hole one night. It had been cloudy that night, with no moonlight for the pool to reflect, and the thickets of hair had prevented their lamps from shining off the pool's surface. Breton had been a short distance away when he heard his co-worker take a few steps and a sudden shout and a large splash. By the time he turned his lamp in the direction of the shout and rushed over, his friend had already sunk beneath the pool's glimmering surface. Salt scouts are, us are used to the hazards of the job, and they didn't panic despite the unusual circumstances. Breton and his co-worker imme immediately lowered a rope into the pool to try and rescue their unfortunate companion. But no matter how much the rope they lowered into the pool, it never seemed to reach the bottom. Even when they ran out of rope, they still hadn't found the bottom. Oh no. Their next step was to lower a lamp into the pool, hoping to illuminate the fluid from the inside. Maybe that would make their co-worker's silhouette visible, but not only was the fluid in the hole completely opaque, even with the lamp on its strongest glow, when they pulled the lamp back out of the hole, it had changed. The lamp had become something they'd never seen before. The outer casing had changed from flesh and bone to an unfamiliar sort of metal, slick and unnaturally shiny, reflected like mer reflective like mercury, and the light source inside had also changed. Gone was the shafir of contained lighting, and in its place was a strange glass tube containing only a pair of wires. Though the lamp still functioned the same as it had before, emanating the same powerful glow, everything about it about its appearance had become unfamiliar. <gasps> it became a real-life thing. What? There must have been an immediate compulsion to drop their other gear into the hole to see what emerged, especially given the innate curiosity it takes for one to become a career salt scout. So I have to commend Bratton and his co-worker for, for refraining. Oh my god, what happened to the person that went inside, though? Their friend was still down there, after all. There was no way to confirm if their friend was dead or alive, or even or even still down there. 
After some discussion, they captured one of the many poor rats scurrying about the flesh fields and lowered it into the hole, but found that poor rats would inevitably chew their way free of the rope, leaving them nothing to reel back up. The hole seemed more mysterious with each passing moment. Finally, with no other solution at hand, Bratton's co-worker decided to take matters into their own hands. Tying the rope around their waist, they lowered themselves into the hole. I can't imagine what Bratton must have felt as the whole shimmering surface closed up over the co-worker's co-worker's descending head, but he kept a cool head regardless. Waiting the agreed-upon two minutes before hauling the rope back up and hoping that his two co-workers came up with it. Instead, what Bratton found at the end of the rope was a note. It was a hastily scrawled affair scribbled in an unfamiliar hand on a scrap of gleaming white paper. It read, I don't think we can come back. It's a completely different world here. What do you mean, different world? I'm not sure. He seems to say it calmly, but I've known Bratton long enough to tell he's just about ready to burst with excitement, curiosity, nerves. His first bristling to almost twice its usual volume, lips pulled back to bare the entirety of his teeth and a sliver of black gums. His claws are digging into the ground hard enough to puncture the surface skin, drawing out beads of blood fleck fat. And he only seems to realize it when the ground begin beneath us twitches. He hurriedly withdraws his hand instead, balling them up into fists to rest against his thighs. I'm assuming, like, you go back, I mean, you go in, and it's humans, but I don't know. I don't know if it's gonna be, um, we're in the weird one, and then we go into IRL world. <laughs> A different world. I have no idea what he means, but it's... that's... I want to know what that means. Bratton's eyes are fixed on our reflection on the pool's surface, but I know it's not the reflection he's looking at. He's trying to see beyond the surface, deep into the hole's maw. Ma. I almost don't want to say. Ask what happens next. Ask what he plans to do next. So what's the plan? But I think it would be best to try to understand what Bratton's thinking first and foremost. So, what are you planning on doing now? Bratton whips his head over to look at me, eyes bright, brighter than I've ever seen them. I thought about that a lot, you know. What should I do next? What would be best? And at first I considered taking this to the boss, telling them that they had to rescue my co-workers and get a team to go in there to figure out what happened, but... The silence drags on for a few moments. I gently prompt him, but... I think I'm gonna try to handle this myself first. Huh? I'm gonna do something drastic. I wanna figure this out, Bill. It's the biggest thing that some of us will ever see in our lifetimes. I let my eyes fix on the horizon and the distance as... as I think things over for a second. It's not that I can't understand Bratton's excitement. After all, I'm finding myself pretty intrigued by this, too. But all the same, it's hard to tell if he's doing the right thing. Are you not going to tell anyone about this hole, then? I'm not sure. This is pretty important, I guess. I'm sure there's a lot of work to be done researching this hole and figuring out exactly what's going on here. It's not like I'm planning on keeping it secret forever or anything, it's just... We found this first, you know, me and my friends. So I think I deserve to take a crack, crack at figuring this out before everyone else does. What about your co-workers? Shouldn't you get more help for them? Not really. Bratton shrugs, rolling his shoulders in a casual gesture. Salt scouts go missing all the time. If anyone goes missing for more than half an hour, we just assume they're dead or they'll come back on their own. With so much ground to cover, we can't waste days looking for people who are gone. It's just part of the job. That makes sense, I suppose. So for now, I want to take a stab at figuring out what's going on, but maybe I'll leave a note for my boss explaining everything when I go in there. Huh? You're going in too? Oh yeah. Did I not say that up front? I'm planning on going into the hole on the eclipse. Maybe I shouldn't have been so surprised by this. After all, it's very much like Bratton to want to head to dive headfirst into things, literally, in this case. And to a certain degree, I can emphasize. But there's still plenty of questions I want to ask. Ask what other steps he might be able to take first. Ask if there's anything you can do to help. Ask if entering the hole is a good idea. I mean, they're alive on the other side. And I am pretty curious. 
asks what you can do to help. Most of all, though, I want to do everything I can to help Bratton. Well... Is there anything I can do to help you? Bratton looks at me like I've said exactly what he was hoping to hear, tell thumping against the ground beneath, behind him. Not anything right this moment, but it means a lot to me that you'd ask. Because you get it, right? You get why I need to do this, I need to go in there. I close my eyes trying to imagine what lies beyond the mirror surface of that pool. Something deep and dark and mysterious, probably, and for someone to want to throw themselves into those steps. It's because you're an explorer, isn't it? Not because you're a salt scout or anything else related to the job, but you're the type of person to do that job. You're the type to want to know the unknown, even if there are risks. Breton nods. Small at first, then again more firmly. This feels important. More important than anything else I've ever done. It would be a different story if things just disappeared in there. I'd not... I'd not step in there, but the fact that that note came back, back specifically saying there's a different world in there, how am I supposed to leave it alone? And with the eclipse coming up, he suddenly turns to me, inadvertently pushing into my personal space. I can feel his warm breaths huff down the wide collar of my cloak. This is my chance, Bill. Even if nobody else will ever know about it, this is important to me. I'll know. I'll know that I did something that almost nobody else in the world has ever done. And that my life will have been worth it for that incredible moment. My chest aches deeply as I listen to this. There's a passion in Bratton's voice that I'm pretty sure I've never felt in my own life. A sort of passion that's almost impossible to contain. I can't help but admire it, honestly. Enough that the thought of losing Bratton to this mysterious void almost feels tolerable. Part of my mind is still hazy with too many thoughts, but I feel I should probably say something regardless. Tell Bratton to be careful when he goes in. Tell Bratton you believe in him, but you want him to be safe. Tell Bratton you should take care of himself. I believe in you, but I want you to be safe. Bratton knows his own priorities better than anyone else, but no matter what he does, I want him to be safe and happy. To be honest, I don't really understand. This isn't exactly my area of expertise. I find a smile crawling across my features despite the gravity of the moment, even... If I don't fully understand the circumstances, Bratton's enthusiasm and passion are still heartwarming, and I deeply, sincerely want him to be happy. But I think you'll be able to choose what's best for you, as long as you'll be safe and happy, I'm rooting for you. Bratton's eyes light up like fireflies, his ears standing up straight, and there's no real warning before he gets to his feet and picks me up in one seamless motion. Even with the wobbly layer of fat underfoot, he shows no sign of stumbling as he twirls me around in a circle. You're so cute to worry for me. He laughs, a loud and boisterous laugh. The momentum of his twirl carries me around for one more lazy loop before he puts me down and hugs me tight. His fur is warm and voluminous against my skin, a long breath huffing hot through my hair. Don't worry, Bill. I'll make the right choice, thanks. The sound of a poor rat scurrying across the ground catches our attention, and we look over just in time to see it race over a large chunk of teeth, then dive into an open pore. The ground around us seems to give a deep sigh, sinking a little lower beneath our weight, and Bratton gives a hearty laugh. Maybe that's a sign it's time for us to leave. I'm not used to staying in place for so long here, either. We're supposed to keep moving unless, we're actu unless we actually find a salt pool. Come on, Bill. I'll let you get back to your work. He offers me a hand, which I take. His enormous paw practically engulfs my hand, gripping me gently as he hefts me to my feet. Here, this way. We don't talk much as he gets back onto his caterpillar. Bratton only gives it a few gentle pats to the side before urging it forward. The caterpillar wriggles a few times, feet popping off the sweaty ground beneath it, but picks up pace quickly, holding onto Bratton to keep holding onto Bratton to keep from sliding off the caterpillar's back. I watch the flesh field slide slide by me, the hole swallowed up by the tufts of hair almost immediately, fading from view like it was never there in the first place. I know it's there, though. It's not something I can easily forget about, not after what I've heard today. Between the soothing rhythm of the caterpillar's gait, the warmth radiating off of Bratton's fur, and the exhaustion of the day, I end up dozing off where I'm leaning, it, where I'm leaning against Bratton's back. Maybe I'm lucky I didn't fall off. Or maybe Bratton was careful about it. All I know is that one moment we're still traversing... The flesh fields, and the next moment I'm blinking awake as a caterpillar slows to a crawl before the park entrance. We're here! Or did you want me to drop you off somewhere else? 
Ratchin turns around gingerly. I peel myself away from his back, shaking my head and smoothing a hand through my a hand through my hair. No, this is fine. Thanks a lot for the ride. I feel like I should thank him for showing me the flesh fields too, but I'm not sure how to word it. Thanks for the show. Ratchin must notice me hesitating because he leans in to huff into my hair, then lick my forehead. It was my pleasure. I'm really glad I got to show you around. Especially since I know you're busy. Really appreciate you taking time for me. I can feel the way a small tu a smile tugs at his lips. His teeth bared slightly against my brow, so I nod. Maybe I don't need to say anything explicitly. He walks me to the edge of the park, back to where I can resume my route, feeling the slick ground underfoot tr transitions to firm rock bed. Oh yeah, here. At the last moment, I remember to retrieve Bratton's salt from my pack and offer it to him. Right, thanks. Good luck on the rest of your route. Thanks, I'll see you later. I tighten the bundle under my shoulder to make sure it's firmly in place and head off at a steady jog. Halfway down the block, I turn to glance over my shoulder and catch sight of Bratton's fluffy tail slipping back into the foliage of the park. My mind threatens to slide back to the hole in the flesh fields, but I shake my head to drag my thoughts back to the present. But for now, I have to focus on my job. My next, my next delivery is a good few blocks away, so I turn the corner and ramp up into a steady gallop. Here you go. Hard at work today, huh? Yes, sir. Things have been a little hectic today. Can't we help, huh? Well, I won't keep you. Be careful now. Thanks. Have a nice day. I'm starting to get a little out of breath. I usually manage to do my entire route at a steady pace, but today's been a day of ups and downs. I've had to rush a lot more after that outing with Bratton, and I can feel my legs starting to ache a little. I slow from a sprint to a jog so I can go down my list of notes. i finish finished most of my route now with only a few more blocks to run, which is good. A quick glance up at the sky confirms that the suns are starting to get set already. The sky's tinging their usual misty, musty green. It's starting to get late, which means I'm cutting it a little close. The palpable tension in the air has been rising all day today. There are more people hanging around the streets than usual, the rowdy, some rowdy and causing trouble while, while others are pressed together in quiet intimacy. I end up taking a long route back home, backtracking a little bit. I, was, I walk past Nyark's store, which, was gone, which has gone quiet by this time. I can still see flickers of movement inside, but it looks like it's mostly just Nyar cleaning up the store by himself. I cut through the park. The atmosphere here is different after dark, the, spi the spindly trees casting twisting shadows across the uneven ground. The air feels colder too, and it feels different without Bratton's boisterous presence walking by me. I think back to that ominous hole puncturing the landscape of the flesh fields nestled in clumps of hair. Its surface a perfect reflection of the moons overhead. And I think of Bratton sitting before it, eyes almost as bright as the reflection itself, just remembering the passion and determination in, in his voice. Sends a small shiver down my back. It's only exhaustion that keeps me from dwelling on it. I walk past the Overlook office, which continues to watch silently over the city, the spire eyeballs lazily cast over the landscape, though they blink slowly now and again, as if growing tired. My thoughts feel fuzzy as I walk back home, watching the three suns sink out of view one at a time. When I get back to my place, I just grab a salt packet and collapse on my bed. I usually don't eat in bed, but I'm too tired to care today. I roll over on my back to unwrap the fabric and slowly bite off a small mouthful of salt. The familiar sting spreads through my mouth, hot and sharp, and I try not to think about it as I let it dissolve on my tongue. Even eating feels exhausting. I jerk awake to the sound of my alarm beetle buzzing. I immediately close my eyes and roll back over, burying my face into my pillow. The desire to go back to sleep is tremendous, which is pretty unusual. I almost never have trouble waking up in the morning, but my limbs still hurt a little bit after all the sprinting yesterday. Yesterday. My thoughts immediately snapped to the sight of that strange hole in the flesh fields. Bratton sitting before it, and that certainly wakes me up. I jolt upright in an instant, my drowsiness dissipating like so much smoke. I sit up in bed, scuffing a hand over my face and picking off the pus that's dried over my eye during the night. A cursory check of the time tells me I'm not late, but I should move quickly if I want to be on time, so I do. And I try very hard not to think about the eclipse. I have the time to spare for that once I'm already, once I'm actually on my route.
Leaving the salt plant empty-handed so early in the day feels profoundly weird, and I'm not quite sure what to do with my hands as I head towards the door. It's almost a relief when the boss calls me right before I reach the door. Right, Vil. Hold on a second. Yes, boss? He trops over, digging through the pocket of his apron and pulls out a few scraps of paper. He returns most of them to his pocket, but holds, holds one out to me. Some big guy from earlier gave me this, said it's for you. A big guy? Yeah, big and furry, lots of teeth. Probably Bratton. I take the piece of paper, smiling to myself a bit at the frayed edges and the haphazard way it's been folded. Unfolding it reveals a short message written in Bratton's messy scrawl. Hey, Bill. I want to talk to you about you-know-what. So can you come by the park when you have time? Thanks. This is Bratton. It's so like him to call it the you-know-what. I smile to myself as I fold the note back up and tuck it into my pocket. Something wrong? No, nothing's wrong. It just seems that he wants to talk to me about something. The boss nods, hands still settled on his waist. Hey, boss? Yeah? What are you going to do during the eclipse? I take my time heading to the park, going... <laughs> this music, or at least the beginning portion, makes me think of, like, futuristic, you're going to the club. Or you're at the club, and everybody might not be dancing very well. <laughs> or at least you. I take my time heading to the park. Going there at such a leisurely pace is an unfamiliar experience, but not a bad one. Not at all. I inhale deeply when the greenery starts to loom ahead. There's a, fre there's a fresh, snappy quality to the air that chases away any lethargy with an undercurrent of sweet, damp earth. I don't see Bratton anywhere, but I do get here awfully early. He might not have been expecting me to get here until later in the afternoon, but that's fine. I don't mind spending some time in the park. The earth underfoot is pleasantly damp, squishing slightly under my weight as I walk a short way down the main path. The chittering of insects and rustling of leaves is soothing. I stop to sit down on a stump, closing my eyes as I listen to the far-off shouting of a crow. Of course, my thoughts drift to the hole in the flesh fields. The myriad abyss full of mystery. The hole that Bratton is planning on dis disappearing into today. Bratton will probably slip into another world today and never come back. Hey, Vil! Bratton swoops in out of nowhere, arms squeezing around me in a giant warm hug. You got here fast! Bratton's so cute. He's so friendly. <laughs> I want a hug. He's so fuzzy. I must have been awfully absorbed in my thoughts since I didn't even hear his footsteps approaching. I let Bratton heft me to my feet, giving his arm a small pat. Yeah, the boss ended up giving me the day off. I wasn't sure what to do, so I thought I might as well just come here. Huh? To be honest, I didn't expect you to come around until the afternoon either. Bratton shifts his weight from one foot to the other, fidgeting. He seems restless, like he's just waiting to bring something up, but isn't sure of the right timing for it. And I find a small, I find a smile creeping onto my face as I watch him rub at the back of his neck. Come on. I pat his arm again. Let's get something to eat and then we can talk. We walk to a snack stall near the park entrance. There's a large sign posted at the window reading, Closing at midday for Eclipse. Thanks. I get some salt pellets wrapped in sweet leaves. Not something I usually eat in the morning, but I figured if I ever deserve a treat, it's on Eclipse Day before I have to have an important talk with my friend. Bratton buys sheared salt slabs doused in lymph, lymph sauce. Both orders come with a cup of sweet nectar water, and we drink in small sips as we walk back towards the park. Here, this way. Bratton tilts his head towards a small path off to the side. There's a nice spot we can eat at. He leads away to a small clearing off the main trail. A ring of small mushrooms surround a giant cluster of mushrooms. They're soft and springy to touch, almost like pillows, and they make for wonderfully comfortable seating. We settle down with our snack and eat quietly for a few moments, listening to the chirp of birds. Far away, there's the sound of people shouting and cheering, but the noises are quickly swallowed up by the park's ambience. Or ambiance. It's nice. It's a nice day for the eclipse to happen. Bratton suddenly clears his throat and I look over. He doesn't say anything, though, just popping another salt slab in his mouth. The salt crystals crunch loudly between his teeth. He seems to be avoiding looking at me. It's not like him to seem so nervous. Well, I guess anyone would be nervous before attempting so, before a attempting something so adventurous. I decide to break the silence. Instead, what should I say, though? 
I always do that. I just run on. I decide to break the silence instead. What should I say, though? Ask if he's really going to enter the hole. Say it's a good day. It's a nice day for some trying something new. Wish him luck. Say it's a nice day for trying something new. It would be nice to send Bratton off feeling good. You know, it's a nice day today. Good weather for trying something new, I think. Bratton looks over at me, ears perked up attentively like he's heard something delightful, and then he gives me an enthusiastic nod. Yeah, you're right. He gingerly pops the last sla salt slab in his mouth, crunching on it loudly before t continuing. I'm really glad it's a nice day today. It really gets your blood pumping, you know? There are a few salt stray salt crystals stuck to the short hairs of his muzzle when he gives a wide grin, and I smile back as I reach up to brush them off. Yeah, I didn't have really high expectations for the eclipse at first, but it really feels sort of exciting now that it's here. I hope everything goes smoothly for everyone, and especially you. Bratton licks my hand, dragging his tongue from wrist to fingertips in one long, warm swipe. It tickles. Everything will go well, I'm sure of it. Even if things start going not well, I'll make them go well. I can't help laughing. Somehow I can totally believe it. I'm sure you will. I eat a few of my salt pellets. The sharp sting of salt cuts nicely through the cloying sweetness of the leaves, making for a really tasty snack. It's been a while since I've had these, and they're, and they're tastier than I remember. I pop another one in my mouth before handing, holding out a few for Bratton to take. Do you want some? Hey, Vil. There's a sudden gravity to Bratton's voice, and I automatically pull back my hand. Yeah? Would you... Would you go in the hole with me? That certainly catches me off guard, but not necessarily in a bad way, I guess. It's just surprising. You want me to go in there with you? Yeah. I put the salt packets back in their little container, absently licking my hand clean. Then I stare off into the greenery surrounding us. A crow in a nearby tree has been staring at us, I realize. It might be after our food. Ah, but I know I'm just letting my thoughts wander because of the subject on hand is so difficult. So noisy today. <laughs> the thought of going into that hole is definitely a little frightening, but at the same time, it makes me a little giddy too. Going into, the, going into completely uncharted territory, seeing what this different world is like, at Bratton's side, it's scary, but also a little exciting. It's a big de decision to make, and I toy with the little container in my lap as I think over what to say. Did you ask anyone else? Bratton shakes his head. Then, why did you decide to ask me? Bratton exhales slowly, sitting forward, and the movement ripples through his muscles. His ears twitch gently as he thinks. You know, I remember when I first met you on your delivery route. I probably look a little surprised about where the conversation seems to be going, because Bratton gives a husky laugh. I was just thinking back to it. I know salt delivery isn't an easy job because there's a lot of places to stop by and you're running all day. And there's all those notes you have to keep in mind and you were a little behind on your deliveries the first time I saw you, remember? You were all out of breath from running and you were holding your scrap of paper with your notes on it, but it was crinkly from sweat. Breton laughs again a little louder and his lips pull back to show his teeth. His tail wags once, thumping against the mushrooms beneath us and kicking up a small cloud of spores. You were in a rush, but I remember you still made sure to say hi to me, and that was really cute. You were all out of breath and looking frazzled, but you still smiled and said hello, and then you ran off as fast as you could, look looking at your note so you wouldn't make any mistakes. What does this have to do with going in the hole, I wonder? Bratton clears his throat before sitting up straight, looking off into the surrounding foliage as he continues. I don't know a lot of people who are as hardworking as you, but you also always try to be friendly. You're really reliable, but you're not too serious either. I can't remember the last time you missed a day of work, but you don't just do the work. You always try to smile at people too, and I think that's really admirable. And if I'm gonna... gonna end up in a strange world, and there's nobody else I'd rather have with me. I'm sure I'm still blushing a little. It's not often that anyone compliments me so directly, and I draw my knees up, resting my chin on them. I'm suddenly glad for the way my hair and the sores on my face obscure my expression a little. I'm sure I look pretty embarrassed. Thanks, it means a lot to me that you'd say such nice things. I think you're pretty reliable and friendly too, you know? Not as much as you, though. Bratton leans closer to me, resting his head atop mine for a moment. His breath, his warm breath huffs down my back before he sits back up. So what do you say? Do you want to make the jump with me? Admittedly, I feel a little shiver of anticipation crawl down my spine when he says those words. 
But I don't want to rush this rush this decision either. Well, Bratton must be able to sense my hesitation because he pats my back. It's a gentle gesture despite its despite his tremendous strength. His paw pads squishing against my shoulder blades when he rubs at my back once, twice. You don't need to answer it right away. The mushrooms squeak beneath us as Bratton settled on its back, then swings his legs up and springs to his feet in one swift motion. A sprinkling of mushroom spores swirl around him as he offers a hand to me to help me to my feet. I accept it. Do you have any other plans for today? I think for a moment. Not really. Then do you want to kill a little time together until the eclipse? I can show you around a bit. I bet I know lots of weird places you've never stumbled across before. Though Bratton starts to add something more, he changes his mind at the last moment and only gives me a big a big grin. I feel like what went unsaid was something along the lines of, After all, I won't be here anymore after today. Regardless of what I decide to do, today will probably be the last day I get to spend any time with Bratton. How could I possibly turn you down? I give Bratton a, small, a smile and his tail wags furiously. He holds my hand as we walk towards the park's side entrance. I think Bratton isn't doing it consciously and I don't mind it, so I say nothing about it. Bratton's caterpillar is there tied to a pole, chewing on a patch of grass near the entrance. It looks up with a squeal when we approach, strings of drool connecting from its mandibles to the blades of grass. Bratton, of course, hurries over to rub at its head and pull it away from the grass, saying something about how too much wild grass will give it an upset stomach. He pulls a few rolled up leaves out of a pouch on the caterpillar's harness and feeds it those instead. The caterpillar seems to love them, chew chewing enthusiastically. Here, hop on. He's already gotten into place on the caterpillar's back, and he pats the spot behind him. I clamber on and wrap my arms around Bratton's middle, pulling myself close to him to keep myself safely balanced. His fur is warm against skin. You still have your eyes closed, right? Yeah. For real? Yeah, I promise. Okay, good, because we're almost there. Bratton had eventually stopped the caterpillar at the edge of a nearby field and promised to show me something very special and while i don't i didn't doubt him he's leading me through what feels like a forest and stepping over tree routes roots <laughs> with my eyes closed is admittedly a little challenging his fingers are firmly grasped around my hand but they can't stop a particularly low hanging branch from thwatting me in the forehead oh sorry here let's do it like this he lifts me up like I weigh nothing, one hand propping up my back and the other beneath the crook of my knees. There, that should keep you safe. And before I can voice any complaints, Bratton takes off at a brisk jog. His shoulders crash through any branches, unfortunate enough to be in the way. Surprising Surprisingly, I emerge completely unscathed, presumably because Bratton is holding me protectively to his chest. His footsteps thump easily off the dirt, traveling what sound like an ill-defined path through the woods until he finally comes to a stop. I think I can hear water. And you can open your eyes now. Oh, wow. The, explana the exclamation leaves my lips before I can think to stop myself. We're standing in a small clearing lit warmly by sunlight filtering through near translucent leaves. Birds trill overhead, calling to each other with noises I'm not familiar with, with the steady chirping of insects filling in any gaps in their conversation all set to soothing backdrop of a waterfall churning in a small pond. The water is gorgeous, shimmering brilliantly in the sunlight like it's made of molten metals. I have to crouch at the water's edge to see that there's a reason why. Eyes? They're jelly worms! Looking closely, I can tell the water's flowing at a languid pace, thick and viscous with these worms. They lend the water a shimmery, almost gelatinous quality, causing it to lap up against the ground in thick blobs. I gently touch my fingers to the surface of the water, then quickly withdraw them. It's cold? Nice and cool, right? They're perfect for a sunny day like this. And without further, further ado, Bratton begins wadding into the pool. The jelly worms and water swirl around his body. His body easily parts through them, leaving a hole that lingers for a split second before closing back up. Light bounces off the worms all around him, surrounding him surrounding him in an almost blinding halo of light. Come on in, it feels great! Bratton's teeth are bared in a huge smile, and it does look awfully fun in there, so I carefully remove my cloak, find, folding it roughly and draping it over a low-hanging tree branch. Then I... I walk in. <laughs> Decide to slowly work my way into the water. It's cold after all, and I want to give myself a chance to uh, acclimate to the unfamiliar texture. 
After taking a deep breath, I wad into the water. The jelly worms promptly close up around my body, soft and smooth to the touch. They barely seem to move on their own, instead following the movements of the water, and it tickles when they brush up against the inside of my thighs. When I run my fingers across the surface of the water, they give way beneath my fingertips, a steady stream of curious eyes staring up at me as they glide by. You weren't kidding, this really does feel incredibly special. Bratton chuckles as he walks alongside me. Yeah, but it feels great, doesn't it? Here, watch this. Without giving me a chance to answer, Bratton plunges further into the waterfall, diving beneath the surface. The water glimmers in his wake, the ripples settling down quickly and leaving surface the surface tranquil for a split second before he emerges, triumphantly. Bratton throws both arms in the air as he breaks through the surface, throwing jelly worms in all directions. They catch the sunlight while they're airborne, light reflecting off and through them, sending beautiful spots of light dancing across our surroundings. Wait. Oh, they're very translucent. They're kind of cute. Sending beautiful spots of light dancing across their surroundings. It's beautiful, right? I found this spot years ago while exploring, and it's always been my secret treasure. It really is beautiful. My voice is breathless and tempered with awe. I cut my hands gently and gently scoop up some of the water, then slowly let it pour back out, watching the jelly worms sparkle with every movement. Thank you so much for sharing this with me. It's amazing. When I get no response, I look up to see Bratton smiling at me. I'm just really glad I got to show it to you. I'm really going to miss it when I go away, both you and this place. So let's forget everything else and have a good time right now, okay? I can understand the sentiment. Bratton is fearless and brave, but that doesn't mean he lacks attachments. He still loves the city and everything in it. It's just that exploring that unknown world is more important than anything else. So I nod, smiling. Of course. We end up spending a good few hours there, in our own little world, surrounded by the lights of the jelly worms and the soothing chill of the water. The viscosity of the water and the density of the worms makes it easy to float on the surface, and when I lie back and look at the sky, I can see the three suns slowly, slowly nearing each other. The moment I have to make my decision grows near bit by bit. What are you going to do with her? We're on our way back from the waterfall, passing by the park once more when I realize that at some point, Bratton will have to leave behind the caterpillar we're riding. Bratton seems to have the same realization and looks down. The caterpillar continues steadily forward in little lurches, carrying us without complaint, but it slows to a stop when Bratton gives it a double pat on the back. Actually, let's walk from here. I climb down without complaint, but Bratton, but give Bratton a curious look and he grins. I want to save her energy if I can. I'll take her to the hole, but let her go afterward. She's used to the route we always go, so she'll know to return to the Salt Scout's corral when it starts getting dark. There's a pause before he adds, looking a little awkward. I mean, I guess you might need her too, after the eclipse, if you have to head back. There's an unspoken tension in the air. Bratton hasn't asked me that very important question yet, and I'm not sure how I'd answer either, so I only give a small nod. That's fine, I think, I think walking would be nice. I give the caterpillar a small rub down a, seg rub down a segment of its back, and I can feel the shift of muscles beneath its skin. Great! The weather's decent today, but the sun's not too hot, so it should be a nice walk. Come on, this way. The walk through the flesh fields takes a while, but that's fine. We still have plenty of time before the eclipse. The skin beneath our feet is pliant at spots, mushy patches of fat compressing under our weight. Those areas are exhausting to get through, and Bratton periodically stops so I can catch my breath. Once or twice he asks if I'd like him to carry me, but each time I say I appreciate the thought, but I'm fine. This is nice, because... Well, we did get, like, um, interactions with Yitzal. It was, like, only at the workplace, because while I know that he always has to be, like, watching, it just didn't feel as close. And so we didn't have any of the previous interactions. And we just have to assume that their relationship is pretty good, and then we have what we personally got to see. 
But I just, even though I liked his design and I thought he was very interesting, I just, I didn't feel close. But Bratton is very like, you know he's your friend. I don't want to wear him out when such a big moment is coming up soon. We talk about this and that as Bratton leads the way around big piles of gristle and bone. Poor rats peer at us from their holes, poking their noses out of holes buried in into surrounding skin, but they never draw too close. I wonder if they too can feel that something unusual is about to happen. Do you think they know anything about the eclipse? Bratton's looking at a poor rat sunning itself out on a large tooth and I grin. Maybe they also plan to do something special during the eclipse, who knows? Even with the long walk, we reach the hole with a little time to spare. Bratton loops the caterpillar's harness over a craggy chunk of bone, then retrieves the visor from one of its pouches, slipping it on so he can squint up towards the sun. Doesn't look like it'll be long before the eclipse. I nod and sit down next to the hole, looking over the mere slick surface. My reflection stares back at me, ripples dance across its surface. When Bratton takes his seat next to me, sending tremors through the surrounding skin and distorting our reflections until they blur together into one indistinct shape. For a long moment, he sits there in silence. I can hear his breaths moving through his barrel chest, exhaling in, a, in long huffs, and I can tell he's about to speak when his next breath comes a little shorter. I look over just as he opens his mouth. Vil, will you come with me? Just hearing that question sends a thrill racing through my chest, my heart beating a rapid drum beat against my ribcage. There's a clear gravity in Bratton's voice, and I know I shouldn't answer this question easily. It's a big decision to make. I turn away as I organize my thoughts because I know look, looking at looking Bratton in the eye right now will just scatter my thoughts. Every breath I take feels hot and heavy in my throat, and I clench my hands together. I tight. <laughs> as I stare at Bratton. <laughs> I I thought I'd need longer to deliberate, but it feels like part of me was just waiting for this moment to talk. The words leave my mouth one by one, quiet but firm, and I hear my own voice cut through the ambience of the flesh field. I, yes, yes, I do. I will. God, that threw me for a loop. <laughs> I, I, I forgot how fricked up her face is. <laughs> I want to go with you, I said, and I immediately know it was the right thing to say. I exhale sharply, feeling a tingle of euphoria, re, euphoria work its way down my spine, so I repeat myself. I want to go through that hole with you. Bratton stares at me for a moment. I almost wonder if he didn't hear me, but just as I start to repeat myself, he whoops. There is no warning before he grabs me up in his arms and twirls in a circle, swinging me around like a toy. It's a little disorienting, but he stops quickly enough, instead pulling me close to his chest and s squeezing me tight. The warmth of his fur envelops me like a blanket of soft fluff laid over, lo laid over taut muscle as he nuzzles, nuzzles the crook of my neck. Okay, this has been on my mind, so... The lamp going in changed into metal, and if we go in, will we change? And will we have a, like, um, a Beauty of the Beast moment where we go, Oh no, oh no, 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 he not handsome no more. Or will we be normal? I'm also thinking about, like, what if we go in and Bratton turns into a dog <laughs> and not a person, and I don't know what we're going to turn into because we're kind of like an amalgamation. <laughs> it doesn't seem like anything, like, terrible happens, and they could still write, so, but I don't know what kind of, like, beast they were. The warmth of his fur envelops me like a blanket of soft fluff laid over taut muscle as he nuzzle nuzzles the crook of my neck. I'm so glad, Vil. 
He squeezes me even tighter, just enough to make the air escape my lungs in a wheeze, then gently puts me down. He bends over a little as he puts me down so he can look me in the eye. I'm so happy. I'm really, really happy you're willing to go with me. Thank you so much, Ville. I've never heard Bratton sound so sincere. Not that Bratton is ever insincere, but he's always been so confident and playful, like a gale whipping through a forest, but now there's a clear gravity to his words, and I can feel the way he's practically vibrating with true joy. It makes my chest feel tight to know my answer was able to make him so happy, and I lean forward to bump foreheads with him. Me too, Bratton. I'm excited to do this with you. I'm really happy you asked me to join you. Bratton laughs softly, the sound rumbling up from the pit of his stomach to growl past his teeth, and he nuzzles my head, huffing out a warm breath through my hair. We stay like that for a few long moments before the sound of scrambling in the distance catches our attention. The noise turns out to be a small group of poor rats scratching about near a cluster of small teeth, probably in search of food. We catch each other's gaze and laugh. Hey, come on, let's sit down. He looks up, holding his visor before his eyes as he squints towards the sky. It looks like there's still some time left before the eclipse, so let's rest uh, rest until then. How about over there? I point towards a large unbroken tooth near the hole, its base surrounded by flecks of fat and scraggles of hair. Sounds good. Bratton helps me clamber up the tooth and climbs up himself sitting next to me. Together we stare out over the flesh fields, listening to a hot breeze whistle across the flat terrain. And as the immediate rush of excitement settles down a touch, I find my thoughts growing crowded. Do you think I should leave behind a note or something? Huh? For my boss and neighbors to find? They have no idea what I'm doing after all, and I think they might be worried if I suddenly vanished. Yeah, you're right. Hold on a moment. Bratton hops off the tooth and goes back to his caterpillar. I watch as he rummages through the pouches on its back, then fondly gives it a rub on the head. The caterpillar's mandibles shift. It seems to have been chewing on a clump of hair. Bratton returns with a map and a pencil, presenting them to me proudly as he hops back onto the tooth. Here, you can leave a note on this. It's normally so we can note down where we find salt pools or find dangerous spots, but I don't have anything else to, else to write notes on. And maybe it'll seem more mysterious if we leave our note on a map, but don't actually write down where we're going. He's still thinking of dramatics even as we near the pivotal moment. I give a wry smile as I accept the pencil. Thanks, I'll try to make sure I don't leave any clues behind. Don't worry about it, you should write what you need to. I don't want you to feel bad about leaving people in the dark. I nod as I put the pencil to paper, but Bratton's concerns are unnecessary. I already have a good idea of what I want to write. I keep it fairly short and simple. It's not like I'm a particularly eloquent person anyway. I've taken this chance to go traveling. I'm not sure where I'm going, and I don't know if and when I'll return, but I'm very excited. Sorry for leaving so suddenly. I hope everyone will be well. My thoughts are always with you. Thank you for the time we spent together, Bill. I'm done. Already? I'd expected Bratton to be reading over my shoulder, but he seems to have resisted the temptation. Yeah. I wanted it to be simple, and I wouldn't really know what to say if I made it any longer. Huh. Bratton gives a thoughtful huff, the breath ruffling the longer, fluffier tufts of hair on his chest. It's an endearing sight, and I grin at him before sliding off the tooth and stepping towards the caterpillar. I'll just tuck it into her harness, okay? Yep, someone will find it then. The caterpillar pays me no mind as I fold the note in between its skin and the harness, twisting it around the strap so it won't come loose when... come loose, but is still immediately visible. Bratton is staring off across the flesh fields when I clamber back up onto the tooth. When I sit close to him, he heaves a quiet sigh and wraps an arm around my shoulders, pulling me closer so I lean on him. It's warm and comfortable like this, the fluff of, Brant the fluff of Bratton's fur guarding against the periodic breeze that whips across the flesh field, and we talk. Not about anything in particular, but today might be the last day we spend here with the place we're familiar with, so we can't help reminiscing. Bratton tells me about his favorite spots to relax, about the strange things he's found while searching for salt pools, and about his friends, the other salt scouts, the funny people he's met around town. Some of them are people I've also run into, or even on my deliver or even my delivery clients. I got too much air in my belly. It, it's disrupting me. And I make sure to tell him each time. Time goes by easily as we share stories about. Is, is so the flesh hoarder in were woo, woo, who decorates all of his clothes with an astounding number of teeth. 
I laugh when Bratton describes Givilli, who had always seemed so normal when I tr when I delivered his salt to him, but apparently spent his free time teaching crows to sing his favorite songs. Man, I'm going to miss everyone. Me too. The cold breeze cuts across the flesh fields, flattening tufts of hair and kicking around loose teeth. I scrunch up smaller against Bratton's side, and he pulls me closer until the wind subsides. Hey, Vil? Yeah? Are you sure you want to do this? I can't pretend I'm totally confident in the decision, so I have no immediate answer. But pressed close to Bratton like this, I can hear the beat of his heart thumping steadily against his ribcage. It's a calming rhythm, remaining consistent even as he waits for my answer, and I close my eyes. I feel like as long as I could hear the sound, I'll be able to handle most things. It's really scary going to this unknown place, to be honest, but I think it'll be worth it. I want to try new things, I want to see things I haven't seen before, and I think if I'm doing this with you, I won't feel so scared. So, I'm sure I want to do this. Bratton doesn't respond, just holding me close, but the way his fingers curl around my shoulder says enough. There isn't much else to say. We sit quietly for a long time, watching the scenery of the flesh fields. A few clouds drift lazily overhead, but the skies are otherwise clear. The greenish glow of sunlight watches over the clumps of bone and teeth littering the fields, glistening off slices of fat visible past the topmost level of skin, and highlighting the movement of scurrying poor rats. It's peaceful out here without the bustle of the city, and I feel a calm settling over my mind. It's only when Bratton gives me a jostle that I snap back to my thoughts. It's here. The eclipse is coming. He hands me a visor, pulling out a second one from his pouches. He's better prepared than I expected. Donning the visors, we look towards the sky and watch as the moon begins to encroach upon the sun's shape. The dark shadows begin to eat away at the sun's outline, first on one side, then also at the other. A strange quiet begins settling over the flesh fields, and when I look down, I can see several poor rats frozen in place. They're also staring upwards, no doubt startled by the way the skies are suddenly starting to go dark. The way their noses twitch is kind of cute, and I smile as I also look back look back upwards. I wonder if Bratton and I also look so dumbfounded. Though the view is slightly marred, marred by stray clouds, it's still impossible to miss the way the sun's light is starting to be carved away. There's a strange electricity in the air as the skies continue to darken. Next to me, I can hear Bratton's pulse quicken a touch, a deep breath echoing through his chest. His hand squeezes tighter at my shoulder for a moment as the moon continues to eat away at the sun's light. They move along their path with no hesitation, steadily crawling forward bit by bit. The flesh fields feel unnaturally quiet, as if even the breeze and the different animals have been arrested by this strange sight. Closing my eyes for a moment, I think I can hear the rush of my own blood in my veins. When I open them back up, it almost feels like night. The skies are peppered with dark smudges of cloud, light, lit up only by a sliver of light that fights past the shadow of the moon. And even as we watch, the moon continues along its respective paths, slowly consuming the sun's shape. That sickle-shaped slice of sunlight grows slimmer and slimmer, petering out to a bright glare at one corner. After a few moments, that, too, dims as if fighting for its life. Time seems to stand still when it fades, leaving only a perfect circle of white stamped in the skies like a sigil. I find my breaths coming short, hands gripping tight at Bratton's, and I give a small jump when Bratton whispers, It's time. Let's do it. Now? My voice also comes out a whisper. It feels oddly hard to speak. They are heavy and tense like something monstrous is bearing down on us. The uncanny darkness makes the flesh fields feel all the more terrifying but beautiful and I shiver slightly as Bratton pulls away to slip off the tooth. His feet pad quietly against the ground. It's so quiet I can hear the squelch of fat and fluids underfoot. Yeah, now. He holds his hand out for me to take, and I do so. As I slip off the tooth, I look back up. The eclipse is still at its peak, sunlight reduced to a faint glimmer that barely lights our surroundings. We need to hurry. The surface of the hole is almost black in the absence of sunlight. Our movement sends ripples dancing across its surface, needle-thin slivers of light sliding across that mirror slick before dissipating. 
The abyss feels all the more intimidating in the silent, oppressive atmosphere of the eclipse. A shiver of anticipation prickles down my spine and I look up to Bratton. He's staring intensely at the hole. Ready? His words are exhaled breathily, barely above a whisper. Though my thoughts instantly flash to everything I'll be leaving behind by entering this hole, my home, the boss, all my clients, my familiar surroundings, and everything else I've ever known, I don't give it a second thought before nodding. Ready. Already the eclipse's apex has passed. The glimmer of light glares across the whole surface as the sun begins to emerge from behind the moon's shadow, and Bratton grabs me grabs me up in his arms. His grip is tight but surprisingly tender, holding me close to his chest without suffocating me. The warmth of his fur surrounds me like a heavy blanket with only a small touch of cold when his nose brushes against my ear. Let's go. I barely have the chance to close my eyes and nod in response to those low words before Bratton throws himself and me in his arms into the hole. There's barely ill. <laughs> There's barely a splash. The substance in the hole accepts us with no resistance at all, the surface of the pool closing up over our heads in near silence. Then it drags us in deeper and deeper. There's a strange suction clawing up deeper into the hole's belly, a force heavier than gravity that drags us relentlessly downward. Though I'd reflexively held my breath, it isn't long before my lungs feel tight, and when I finally open my mouth in a deep gasp, the surrounding fluid pours into me, instantly replacing the remaining air in my lungs. There's no feeling of panic, no sensation of drowning, just a sense of something drastically different surging through my airway and filling my chest. When I open my eyes, the first thing I see is a blurry shadow at the edge of my vision slowly melting away. It takes me a moment to realize that it's Bratton's massive shoulder, his arms still wrapped around me, his fur is falling away in wisps. I clutch tighter at him. Bratton similar, similarly pulls me close, his own grip unwavering. I don't understand what's happening, but I'm not scared. The substance in the abyss has shaped itself around us, holding us, pulling us deeper in, but it seems to grow heavier the next moment. A pressure bears down on us from all sides. It's hot and heavy, but not cruel or painful, just like a pair of hands cupping around us and gently squeezing. I bury my face into the crook of Bratton's shoulder, feeling another wisp of fur brush past my cheek and then flow away upwards. Is something also happening to me? I can't tell. Our surroundings keep growing hotter and denser, a strange pressure prickling at my skin and gently bearing down on my eyes until I'm forced to close them again. It's dark. My breaths feel shorter. The pressure of Bratton's arms around me is the only thing that doesn't change. I hold him tighter, too, and I don't let go even as my thoughts start to scatter. I'm jolted back to awareness by the feeling of landing heavily on a hard, cold surface. The impact is accompanied by the hot sting of the rough surface scraping against my skin. I gasp for air, coughing up glutes of substance from the abyss. It pours from my mouth, leaving strings of hot saliva stringing from my jaw, and each breath of air I gulp down I gulp down feels too crisp against my tongue. My mouth feels sensitive and empty, like my teeth have shrunk. Not just my teeth. My body has a as a whole feels oddly dense, like my skin's tightened too much and shrunk down my frame, compact compacting my limbs down to half their normal length. I finally manage to crack my eyes open a touch. My eyelids feel heavy. It's a struggle to process what I'm seeing. Barren streets stretch before me, flanked on either side by buildings completely devoid of life. Their surfaces sport only cold rock and glass, lacking any veins of flesh or stretches of skin, though a few colorful signs break the monotonous stretch of gray, and I can see the movement of a few people far in the distance. It's an otherwise cold and unwelcoming landscape. I rub my eyes to make sure I'm not seeing wrong. I'm not. Then I realize my hand, too, has changed. It's shrunk. My claws are gone, leaving only thin, flimsy nails in their place, and my fingers feel much smaller, weaker. I won't be able to run like I usually do with my grip weakened like this. Maybe I've changed, just like Bratton lost his fur while we were sinking through the hole. Bratton. Alarmed, I look around for Bratton. He's nowhere to be seen. But I do quickly realize there's another person lying beside me. It's only his bulk that suggests it might be Bratton. Everything else about him is foreign. There's no blanket of fur to hide the stretch of long, muscular muscular limbs. And the sight of so much bare, hairless skin is a little unnerving. The only hair I can spot is on the top of his head, short and bristly, but it's the same shade, shade that Bratton's fur was. Bratton? I take his shoulder and shake gently. The skin is warm beneath my fingers, but feels discomfortingly smooth and featureless. 
<laughs> no, my furry man, he gone. I shake again a little harder. My arm feels so weak. It takes a lot of effort just to jostle this other person. Bratton? Will? The voice that slips out from this other person is both familiar and unfamiliar. Though it lacks the deep rumble of Bratton's signature growl, the way he says my name is immediately recognizable, and I breathe a sigh of relief as the person continues sounding groggy. What happened to you? I think we changed. I wonder how the other salt, salt scouts had reacted to it. Especially if it's like a huge change from what their their body shape is. And my tummy goes ee again. <laughs> I don't know if you can hear it. The person, Bratton, I'm sure it's Bratton now, sits up. He's lost a lot of bulk. Even without his fur, he wouldn't have been this small. He's shrunk like I have. My hand slips from his shoulder down the length of his arm to touch at his hand. His paw pads and claws have vanished, leaving behind tender hands that look a lot like mine, just slightly larger. Flimsy nails, soft skin, fleshy fingers. My fingertips feel far more sensitive as I touch at his knuckles. This is a different world, huh? Bratton looks around. It feels odd seeing him with such a plain, flat face, but there's traces of his usual self in the way he smiles at me. His teeth have mostly been flattened down, but at least two remain fairly sharp, keeping the look a little familiar. Feels weird, doesn't it? It really does. As the shock of our changed appearances settles in, we begin to realize just how different everything feels. The air feels sharper and crisper. The familiar, ever-present scent of flesh and blood have been replaced by a strange metallic tang, undercut by a current of smoke. When I struggle upright, I'm sharply aware of how gritty the ground feels beneath my new soft feet. Bratton also stands and shivers. It's cold. Have you always felt this cold? It must be a shock to suddenly be without fur. Thankfully, I still have my cloak and we share it. The fabric is just enough to keep us warm and cover cover us as we find shelter in what looks like a quiet alleyway, leaning against a wire fence and flanked on either side by cold, dry walls. We rest against each other. Though our new skins are strangely lacking in texture, they're highly pleasant to touch against each other and we keep warm by staying huddled together under my cloak. I should probably be more scared, but I think as long as Bratton is here, we'll manage somehow. We end up resting there until the sun starts to come up. The sun here turns out to be orangish. It's slightly alarming at first to see our surroundings start to light up with an odd yellowish hue, but we soon accept it for what it is. At least the warmth of it permeates through the fabric of my cloak, slowly easing our chills and rousing us properly. The streets also start to come alive with the break of dawn. People begin to move about, and we watch as they trapeze past the entrance of our little alleyway. They all look eerily similar. There seems to be a norm, just two legs, upright, hairless except on the top of the head, with only two eyes, a small nose and mouth. And there are particularly no deviations from that template. Was there no pool where they were? So it's just like you get dumped into the, into the um, human world? Save some differences in hair length and skin tone, everything is alike, and we are like them. Breton mourns the loss of his beautiful teeth. I'm a little sad to lose my speedy legs, but we'll just have to adapt. How are they going to adapt, though? Like, they just dropped into here. That's always my question. When somebody from a different world falls into the human or real world, what do you do? How do you go about getting your identification and everything like that. It's a little after the sun rises and the entire city is lit up that a door near us suddenly opens. It's made of metal with not a single trace of organic life and we stare warily as a person emerges from it. They're dressed curiously in close tight in close fitting clothes that have been dyed bright colors. The person also seems started to spot us. It's hard reading their expression but the wide eyes and slightly parted mouth suggest surprise and hesitation before they speak. Um, you're not supposed to be here. Sorry. I apologize, but I'm not sure what else to say, and I hesitate over my words. The stranger looks us over carefully. Are you okay? Why are you guys naked? As Brat and I look uneasily at each other, the stranger sighs, then glances down the alleyway. He seems satisfied after a few moments and beckons us towards the door. 
Come on. The manager isn't in yet. I'll call someone to pick you guys up if this was a prank or something. The person introduces himself as Dylan as he ushers us indoors. Then he asks us for a phone number, which we don't have, of course. After some hesitation, Bratton explains the situation. We're not sure of where we are, he says. We're lost. We don't have any clothes or money, and we also have no memory of who we are except our names. The last bit is a lie, but no doubt it will go over better than saying that we've come from a different world. Damn, Bratton, you're so smart. One that looks completely different from this alien landscape. My ass would have not had been like, I got amnesia. I would have been like, yo, I don't... what? They'd have to just assume that something is up with me. Breton continues that we're sorry to bother him, but we aren't looking for trouble. We're not sure of exactly what to do, but we just want to survive. Dylan rightfully gives us a long, suspicious look, but he also doesn't immediately question us or ask us to leave. He seems to deliberate for a long moment before giving a heavy sigh. Oh no, I wonder where the salt scouts are. Alright, you guys don't seem like you're high or whatever, so I'm gonna give you wa- I'm gonna have you wash dishes, alright? Oh, Dylan, you're so nice! It takes us a few moments to understand what he means. It turns out the establishment is some sort of eatery, despite the lack of salt or honey. Dylan says he'll buy us some clothes and feed us so long as we repay, repay the debt by helping him for the day. Otherwise, he says, I'm just going to have the cops deal with you. He generously shocks us both. Bratton lunges across the table to give him a huge hug, which startles him. I opt for nodding enthusiastically and thanking him for his kindness and promising that we'll both do our best. Dylan has us wait in the alleyway while he goes to purchase us some clothes and returns and gives us each a bagel sandwich. The texture of it is odd, crunchy on the outside, but strangely pillowy inside, with a layer of soft, squishy substances between the outer shells. It's a mix of flavors that neither of us are familiar with, rich and almost cloying, with only the faintest familiar sting of salt. It's... good. And Dylan kindly gave it to us despite us being strangers. As frightening as it is ending up in this barren, lifeless landscape, we might be able to manage if the people are still kind. Of course, not everything works out so smoothly. We quickly learned that Dylan's kindness was unusual and that we were fortunate to encounter him first upon arriving in this strange world. Without experience living in this strange world and without any identity, Bratton and I have to learn to adapt. We quickly learn to make up lies about our lives. We work menial jobs where the work is hard and the pay is barely adequate. I work as a dishwasher at a diner and Bratton works for a landscaping company cutting plants. Finding shelter is also difficult without money and without identities and it's only thanks to the help of other people that we manage to survive. We sleep outside during warm nights and find shelter in a place called a church on rainy nights. Oh, this is really sad though. <laughs> The rain here is cold and water instead of blood, so we're grateful for shelter from the needling spray of water. Some people are cruel to us, but others are kind. Life is hard here, but not unbearable, especially because we have each other. We take comfort in each other's company more than anything. I doubt either of us could have survived without the other. No matter how exhausted we are at we are in the evenings, Bratton is quick to smile and point out the things that went well that day. He talks about a new friend he made, or a friendly client who gave him water, or a small animal he got to share his food with. He points to the strange glowing bugs that light up the park when we're huddled together on a bench at night. He wraps his arms tight around me and says he's happy to have me at his side in this strange place. I always squeeze his hand when he says it, and tell him I'm happy to be at his side too. Everything in this world is strange and foreign, but as long as we have each other, we can survive. Whoa, that's how he looks! <laughs> Whoa. Damn. Y'all looking good. <laughs> I wasn't expecting Bratton to have a ponytail, but I vibe with it. Even our bodies are different, and it takes us a while to fully accept that these are now our forms. It's strange at first, exploring our bodies and realizing how different we are now. Our skins feel restrictive at first, too tight around these bodies that are a little too small. Breton complains of feeling barren and bald with, with fur only at the top of his head, while I feel slightly stuffy, covered in this elastic layer dotted with hair. I'm accustomed to the chill of the air against the raw patches on my face, and several mornings I wake up feeling like I've had fabric plastered to my face. It always takes me a few moments of pawing at my face to remember that this is now my body. The extremities of these forms are also far weaker than 
than we're accustomed to. In private, Bratton and I make fun of our small hands and stubby feet. The lack of claws allows for a little traction, and the soft skin of our palms and feet is vulnerable to scratches and friction. We have to learn to care for these tender forms, staying vigilant even, even about small injuries and patching them up frequently. Both Bratton and I are used to physical activity, so we're not used to struggling with anything physical. For the first time in our lives, we find ourselves struggling to move our bodies in the way he, the the way we want. But these bodies aren't entirely awful, we eventually find out. The first time Bratton runs his hand down my back, I feel a shiver ripple down my nerves. He buries his face into the curve between my neck and my shoulder, each hot breath glossing warm against my skin. Eyebrows wiggle. And it's then that I realize the skin, while somewhat stifling, is also warm and sensitive in a way I've never felt before. My fingertips especially are highly sensitive to the texture of Bratton's skin, dipping past little scars and pockmarks. Running over the bumps of veins, I let my hand wander over Bratton's chest, marveling at the way I can feel his pulse so clearly, without the heavy padding of fur. My fingertips graze up to his shoulder, then down the length of his arm, and when I intertwine my fingers with his, I can feel every shift of tendons beneath the thin skin there as he squeezes my hand back. And without words, we, we begin exploring each other's bodies. It's only natural. As the immediate worry of survival starts to abate, we find ourselves increasingly curious about the world and bodies we now live in, and learning more about each other in this way turns out to be very pleasant. Our fingers are the first step. Devoid of any real claws and covered in the most sensitive skin, we take our time running them over each other's bodies. Bratton's nails scrape gently, gently over my shoulder as he easy, eases aside the neck of my shirt. Then come lips, the only parts of our bodies anywhere near as sensitive as our fingertips. There's nothing like the lips either of us had in our previous bodies. Pink and soft and warm, covering only a blunt line of teeth. They're sensitive without being raw, easily molding together when we kiss. Kissing was something we might have found difficult in the past between Bratton's prominent fangs and the raw skin of my face, but in these bodies it comes naturally to both of us. Our first kiss is short and clumsy. We're so unused to the wet, intimate warmth, warmth of the gesture, then we immediately do it again and again. Ayo! <laughs> Even in his current form, Bratton is strong. I hear the sudden ripping of fabric when he impatiently tries to tug aside the folds of my shirt, then feel the fabric go limp against my body as Bratton gives a frustrated huff. His breath grazes warm across my cheek and I laugh. It's okay. We're not in any rush. He calms down a little as we undress, but I can tell he's still feeling impatient. As soon as I set aside my now ragged shirt, he nuzzles into the crook of my shoulder, lips pressing little spots of heat into my skin. I feel the graze of teeth and flinch for a moment, instinctively stealing myself for the sharp poke of fangs, but only feel a slight pressure. Ratten must have felt that flinch because he pulls his head back to look at me. The knit of his brow suggests worry. Did that hurt? No, it's alright. I guess it might have hurt before when I still had my old teeth. Yeah, but it feels nice now. A lot of things feel nice now, like the expanse of his skin, dusky from long hours spent out in the sun, speckled with scraps and pockmarks of s and scratches, but warm and textured to the touch. Like the gentle feel of his arms hefting me up into his lap, somehow more controlled than the strength he'd had in his original body, his hands molding against each dip and curve of my body as he feels me from shoulder to to hips to thighs. Like the way his muscles tense and shift visibly with each movement, no longer masked by the thick layering of fur as he shifts his body to fit perfectly against mine. I decide to kiss him, keeping our lips pressed together until my lungs feel a little tight and hot and heavy. And when I feel and when I finally pull back, I realize his arousal pressing <laughs> I realize his arousal is pressing noticeably up against me. Bratton's never been one to feel bashful, but he seems to falter a little. His cheeks flush bright and hot. There's a speckling of sweat at his brow, plastering a stray strand of his hair to his forehead, and I laugh as I brush it aside. Bratton's so confident that he's looking especially cute when he's flustered. I guess it's a little weird that the first time we do anything like this, it's in these strange bodies. Just a little, yeah. I talk quietly, keeping my words low, like they're a sequ sequence, <laughs> like they're a secret just between the two of us. Kept away from the distant bustle of the city past the windows, with my forehead pressed against his, a subtle heat is trapped between us. 
lovely and warm against her skin as I reach out to touch him. It feels a little foreign at first, like everything is, but we've always adapted well. Now is no different. I let one hand drag down his chest, feeling the beat of his heart and the rise and fall with each breath he takes. My other hand explores the shape of him, fingers curling lightly around, around hot skin. Careful but curious at their very cores. These bodies are similar enough to our old forms that we know what to do, but the subtle differences are just enough that we're constantly making new discoveries. Like the fact that we can't rush into things. Our first attempts to join bodies is awkward and a little painful for me. Bratton is nothing but, uh, but apologetic when I let out a yelp looking terribly alarmed as he lays me back down on the couch. I laugh as I brush a hand against his cheek telling him it doesn't hurt that badly, I just need a small break. He spends the entire time running his fingers through my hair, periodically kissing my temple, and his face lights up when I tell him I'm ready to try again. Things go much more smoothly when we take our time. Bratton breathes glowing words of encouragement as he gently eases me into the moment, his hands pressing into my skin, excited but not impatient. I feel like his pulse is throbbing through his skin, saturating me more with every moment. Even st <laughs> Why didn't I say moment like that? Even so, I want to be closer, closer to him. Sitting over his lap with my hands against his shoulders, I touch his jaw to get him to look up, and then, and when he does, I kiss him. It proves to be a nice distraction to keep me relaxed as I ease myself into place. There's a flutter of pain as my body strains, but it's followed by a sensation intense enough to make my head spin. Are you alright? Yeah. The warmth settled in me is almost too much to take. I need to sit still for a few moments, willing myself to breathe slowly and stay calm. But waiting proves hard. Even before my pulse has stopped ringing in my head, I move to shift against Bratton. He grabs me tight, his arms wrapped around me in a bear hug before his hands drift down, scrambling from my shoulders to my back to my waist, like they don't know where to settle. Head pressed against my chest, he moves sharply enough to make the couch creak beneath us, and I shudder at the feel of his shape shifting inside of me. Our bodies fit together awkwardly at points, but just right at others. It's not perfect, but it does feel right for us, and for one moment I feel like we were back in our old bodies. If I close my eyes, I can almost feel the soft carpet of Bratton's fur beneath my fingers, the slight dig of his claws into my back, the leathery pillow of his paw pads dragging down my shoulders. If I focus a little harder as I brush my hands, stupid bug, <laughs> as I brush my hands through his hair, I feel the reflect the reflexive twitch of his pointed ears and the excited swish of his tail brushing against my legs. Like Bratton's never changed at all. My body too feels properly like my own. I ease myself up in onto my knees and my legs don't feel so scrawny and weak, easily sustaining my weight in one smooth movement and plunging down without effort. My hands grasp against Bratton's shoulders no longer faltering from weakness and the lack of claws. I feel at ease with myself and with Bratton and everything feels the way it should be. His breaths fog hot against my chest as I raise myself back. I just, I just notice my frog hands. As I raise myself back up and I press my lips against his head as I slide back down. I can feel Bratton's thighs tense beneath me, muscles pulling taut and hard as he moves sharply. This feels... A little more intimate than with Yitzhal. Maybe it's because, like... We were being eaten. Like, literally. And you, you can't exactly spend that much time. <laughs> There's only so much of me that you can consume. The sensations inside me spike from the sudden action, and I reflexively wrap my arms around his head, pulling myself closer to him. Our breaths come in tandem, and I let, I let instinct take over as the feedback washing through my nerves rises and crests. Bratton's voice fights, pa fights past the curtain of fog clouding through my thoughts, and it takes me two or three repetitions to realize he's saying my name. His voice sounds like it used to, gravelly and deep, almost like a growl. It's edged with an intense focus as he repeats my name again and again, then once more as he pulls me terribly close to his body. He grabs me close to him like something precious, like something he's trying to make a part of himself. A shearing heat slowly blankets my vision, invading every corner of my thoughts as I sink into the shape of his body. Without hesitation, I allow myself to succumb to the heat of the moment. When my thoughts slowly return to coherence, the moment is over. Neither Bratton nor I have been returned to our old selves, of course. Our skin is still soft and sensitive, and now a little sticky with sweat. Our bodies still a little more frail than we'd like, our breaths coming a little more shallow than they really should. 
With my head resting against Bratton's chest, I listen to his pulse thrum away, taking a long time to slow down. His arms are wrapped around me, his hands resting against my back, and I can tell his hands are back to being soft and clawless and tender. But the observation doesn't disturb me. It's merely that, an observation. We are the way we are now, and while both of us may... <laughs> Just thinking about the rope. Like how... When it came down... They didn't explain when they came down. It didn't explain their surroundings, really. Like, was there evidence of the hole? But, like, for Earth, did they just kind of drop in? When the rope came down for the other salt, salt scouts, was it just in the air? Like, what was going on there? And while both of us may may long for the past we've also accepted what we've become now apparently like they can't go back right so yeah i'm i'm like i'm thinking about it <laughs> hey bill bratton's husky whisper is just enough motivation for me to look up his voice is back to being soft and quiet lacking in the rasping edge that comes from a mouthful of razor sharp teeth still a little, little breathy breathy from the way his chest rises and falls dramatically. Yeah? I'm so happy to be with you. It almost goes without saying. Bratton is honest and his eyes are glowing with a genuine contentment. And I'm gonna feel so incredibly bad when I say I don't want to go. He kisses my forehead, the gesture a little sloppy from exhaustion. Then he repeats, I'm so happy to be with you. So much has happened to us. The abyssal hole in the flesh fields, the all-consuming moment of the eclipse, the sudden arrival to this strange city and the realization that neither of us will ever return to the way that we were. And while none of those events were trivial or easy, they were all surmountable because we had each other. I'm sure things will continue to be hard in the future, and that's alright. We'll manage. We have so far, and we always will. I laugh as I wrap my arms around his neck. My chest feels a little tight, my breath still short. But I don't want to wait another moment. I lean close to him as I answer. I'm so happy to be with you too. End. So I just got reminded of... Um, there was this... I think it was like a paid game. But you get to play a certain amount of the demo. And in the beginning of it... It, it was like a mermaid based society. So... The beginning of it, the main character had been with a romantic partner that they had met on land and had brought them down to join the society. But I guess after a certain point, their relationship fell apart. And so, but he, like, he stuck there. He couldn't, I don't think he could go back, really. Um, and so... Like, that's, that's such a big concern. You're with somebody, especially in, like, a relationship that's, like, very fresh. You're, you're with somebody and you have to live through, like, a whole different society. And then what if it breaks apart and you just, you don't really have anyone? Or, like, you have to go, you don't have somebody that you trust so closely anymore and you have to live through um, this world that you're not really familiar with. And that's really scary to think about given, um, given human society, our society. Our society isn't the best. So imagine being from a place that is more open or more friendly or you ha you're not even like humanoid in any way and then you end up in human society and it's so unfamiliar it's insane like you have to live through something that's worse than where you were <coughs> sorry anyways that was uh bratton's route he was cute as a furry and he was cute as a human. I, I really wasn't expecting... I thought he would be bulkier as a human. And then, uh... Vil was really cute, too. And it's... And it's cool that she 
or sorry, they kept um, the scarring because like when they were their previous form had a big old like just melting face. I don't even know why it's happening, how it's happening, what could have caused that whole deal. Like your eye is, looks like it's gonna fall off, man. And then in the human form, it's... I'm not sure... They, they said it was raw, right? They, uh... They had, like, the darkened spot. Would it would have been, like, a burn in the human version? I don't know, man. Or would it be like when you scratch your skin too much and it gets raw and then when it starts starts healing? So yeah, that was Bratton's route. I hope you guys enjoyed it. Uh I don't think I have to censor anything, right? It was sort of, like there was nothing was showing. I wasn't expecting Bratton's a route to go this way. It was only like when you see the pool that you're just like, oh, okay, that I think I, I know what's gonna happen. But like it wasn't what I was thinking in the beginning that they're gonna become human. Oh my god, I'm saying goodbye. I haven't even done the other <laughs> I haven't even done the other one. Oh my goodness, I'm so sorry. I'm so dumb. Oh, that's not it. Like, no. God damn it. Where is it? Options. Load. I'm such a goober. I'm saying bye. And I completely, completely went over my head. I forgot to do this one. I can't. Bratton stares at me, seemingly confused. I'm so sorry! Don't look at me! You can't? Why not? The disappointment in his voice is obvious, even if he's trying to hide it, and the downward droop of his ears makes me makes my chest sting. I place my hand on his arm, rubbing at the knotted muscle beneath his fur. You mean a lot to me, Bratton, and I'm really touched that you'd ask me something so important. I know that this is really important to you, so just the fact that you would trust me with something like this means a lot to me. But I have too many things I don't want to leave behind. I have my job, my boss, all the people I'm used to. I don't want to leave my life here. Maybe if I were brave like you, I could, but... Bratton suddenly shakes his head hard enough to make his ears flat for a moment. You're really brave, Vil. He clasped my hand in both of his, his paw pads warm and soft against my knuckles. You're brave, I know you're brave, so that's not a problem. And I get where you're coming from, Vil, I understand, it's okay. I know there's a lot of people who would be really sad if you vanished from their lives, so I understand. He lets go of my hands and suddenly wraps his arms around me in a huge bear hug. His arms are strong but gentle, envelop enveloping me entirely in a powerful warmth, and his breath huff down my back when he presses his snout against my shoulder. His voice rumbles from deep in his chest as he speaks. If you think this is the right choice to make, then I trust you. I think you'll make the right choice. I breathe slowly, trying to keep myself calm. Sitting close to him like this, I can feel his warmth, his presence. I can hear the gentle thrum of his heart. I know that this will all soon vanish. I might never feel it again. I hold his arms as I rest my brow against his chest, carving this moment in my memory. Thanks, Bratton. I know you've made the right choice, too. I believe in you. Bratton laughs, the sound rumbling through his chest as he rubs his hand against my back. Thanks, Bill. It means a lot to me. He pulls back to nuzzle my cheek, licking me once. It tickles enough to elicit a laugh, and he takes that moment to slip from my arms and stand up. The ground beneath me shifts faintly from the mo from the movement, especially when Bratton stretches himself out. The muscles all down his back pull whipcord taut, quivering from the strain before he relaxes. He thrusts his arms toward the sky as he shouts. All right, that's the that's out of the way then. No more awkwardness. His voice is as boisterous and energetic as ever, but just for a moment I feel like the same quiver was also in his voice there, then gone, like a cold breeze. 
I stay to watch the eclipse with him, of course, even if I can't actually accompany him through the hole. I refuse to let him go alone without someone seeing him off. Bratton seems happy for the company, though he's visibly excited. I can also tell that he's a little nervous. His tail twitching a little erratically and his ears flattening back against his head once in a while, just for a few moments. I can't blame him. Bratton is brass, brash and courageous, but the thought of entering that slick abyss would strike fear into anyone's heart. As we settle down onto a large chunk of tooth that gives us a great view of the sky, he clenches and unclenches his hand a few times. After a moment's consideration, I lay my hand over it. I can feel the shift of its tendons beneath the stretch of taut skin and soft fur. He's quick to grab my hand back. He squeezes tight, a little too tight for a moment before easing off. And we talk. We talk about his favorite spots to rest while he's out searching for salt pools. We talk about my favorite sites while I'm out on my delivery route. We talk about the other scouts he knows, what he knows about their families, how they all celebrate whenever they find an especially large salt pool. We talk about my regulars and what they must be doing on this very special day. In general, we just talk. But as the suns and moon crawl across the sky, their path inching closer and closer, we find ourselves falling quiet. We still talk about this and that, but an impending gravity made the air feel heavy. Words felt harder. Did do you want me to tell anything to the other scouts after this is all over? I glance up towards the sky and Bratton digs through his pouches for a second visor. He must have brought it for me. I accept it gratefully when he holds it forth. Well, I wait quietly as Bratton thinks. I can feel the brush of his tail swinging first to the left, then to the right behind him. The fluffy tuft of it grazes against my back now and again. No, it's okay. Are you sure? Yeah. Breton puts on his visor and looks to the sky. In profile, his toothy grin is especially handsome, revealing the entirety of his mouth full of teeth. They'll figure things out eventually, but until then, I want to be an enigma. I want people to remember this mystery, at least for a while. Not just for a while. I blurred it out before I can stop myself, and I feel my face color a little when Breton glances towards me. I'll remember this. I won't forget about it. I force my voice steady, saying each word quietly but firmly. I don't want Bratton to think I have any doubts about it. I want him to go through the hole knowing that at least one person will always remember his intentions. Bratton seems to understand, immediately wrapping an arm around my shoulders and pulling me close. With my face buried in the thick fur of his chest, I feel enveloped in his warmth and his breaths huff, huff hot down the back of my head as he answers quietly. Thanks, Bill. That means a lot to me. We stay like that, talking quietly for a little while longer before silence settles over us and the rest of the flesh fields. There's an odd electricity in the air. Even the wildlife seem to realize that something special is happening, and I spot quite a few poor rats scurrying to and fro. Maybe they're alarmed by the fact that the sky is slowly starting to darken. I slip on the visor Bratton gave me and look to the skies, where the sun gleams overhead. Already the moon is starting to converge upon the spot, overlapping with the sun's edge and starting to block out the light. The fine hairs at the back of my neck are starting to stand on end, and I can feel the slight dig of claws as Breton pulls me closer to him. It's starting. It's the quietest I've ever heard him speak, but it feels oddly difficult to speak loudly when the eclipse is happening. Everything comes out in hushed whispers. I only give a small nod, making sure to lean close to him, and together we watch the eclipse. Around us, there's only the sound of a faint breeze kicking around pebbles and the scurry of little rodent claws at the flesh underfoot. With no other people around, the air feels quiet and heavy, thick as blood in our lungs, and I inhale sharply as the moon further encroaches upon the sun's shape. I can feel the slow swell of Bratton's chest next to me as he inhales. He holds his breath for a moment, so do I. He, he exhales slowly as the sky darkens a little further. I do too, but it comes out tense. Around us, a few poor, rat, poor rats have frozen in place. They also seem to be staring at the sky. With a smattering of clouds dotting the skies, it's easy to pinpoint where the sun is starting to be swallowed up by the moon's shadow. Slowly, slowly, the dark shape creeps over to cover a little more of the sun's gleam. Bratton squeezes my hand, and we watch quietly as the eclipse devours the sun. My next breath comes sharp, like my lungs feel tight and I feel a shiver run down my spine. It feels like something heavy and large, larger than I could truly fathom, is bearing down upon the flesh fields like I'm being stared at by something huge and awesome. Other than the thin ring of light fighting past the moon's shadow, the sky is completely dark, 
An oppressive silence has taken over, allowing me, allowing the sound of my own pulse to echo in my ears, and I exhale roughly. It's here. The eclipse. I jump when Bratton suddenly stands up next to me. It's time. Now? Yeah, now. I think it has to be now. Bratton's fur is standing on end, puffed out to almost twice its usual volume all the way down his back, and I can see the way he clenches and unclench unclenches his fists. He must be nervous, but he still hops off the tooth we've been sitting on, sending a jiggle rippling through the flesh around us. A few poor rats scatter and hide, though they seem to peek back out after a few moments. No doubt they've also realized that something about today is different. I gingerly ease myself to my feet, stepping closer to the pool. Bratton is standing at its very edge, hands clenched to tight to tight fists at his side. He looks over when I step up next to him. Wish me luck, Vil. I swallow thickly, then nod. I smile, I smile my best smile. Good luck, Bratton. I know you'll do great. Bratton grins as he leans in. His tender, It's tender and gentle when he huffs at my hair, then licks my forehead. The world around us is still dark. The sky's overlit, overhead lit only by the thin halo of light slicing past the shadow of the moon. Time seems, seems to stand still in the moment that Bratton takes a deep breath. I can hear my heart pounding in my chest. Then, without glancing back at me, he steps forward. There's hardly a splash. Bratton's body seems to slice into the pool's mirror surface like a hot knife through fat, sinking in effortlessly and sending gentle ripples dancing across the surface. There's no struggle, no fighting, no reaction. He simply plunges into that bloody abyss there, there one moment, then slipping downward out of sight the next. I want to say that I saw him smiling in that instant before the pool's surface closed up over his head. By the time I fall to my knees, leaning over the edge of the pool to try and get another glimpse of Bratton, he's already gone. The surface of the pool has already started to calm down, leaving only my distorted reflection staring back up at me. Without thinking, I reach out to touch the surface of the pool. My fingers slide through the surface with practically no resistance, breaking through the mirror sheen. The surface tension of the liquid closes around my hand like a manacle, encircling my wrist when my hand dips fully into the pool but that's as far as I can go. I can't go in there, I already told Bratton I can't. I withdraw my hand after a few long moments, and my fingers come out stained by flecks of shiny red. As I kneel there, the eclipse overhead begins to break apart. Light slowly returns to the world, illuminating the flesh fields around me in dim shades of green and yellow. There is a sound of skittering claws as poor rats and reptiles begin resuming their regular activities. To them, what happened was now... was... was now... Nothing more than a brief aberration, a temporary cause for alarm before the light returned to return the world to the way it was always meant to be. But for me, what happened just now will probably linger in my memory forever. I will always regret this one. I will always regret. The eclipse doesn't last terribly long, or maybe it just feels like it goes by more quickly than it actually does. I stay kneeling by the side of the pool as the skies continue to light up. I'm not sure why. Maybe I'm waiting for some sort of signal from Bratton. Some sign that he's already on the other side of this abyss. That he's safe in this strange new world of his. I don't get any sign, of course. I didn't give him a rope, so... I don't know how he would send me a message. I end up lingering in the flesh fields until the sun starts to set, the skies starting to darken. It's only the threat of getting lost out in the unfamiliar flesh fields that gets me headed back home, and even then, I feel reluctant to leave that hole behind. I hesitate by the pool's edge when... It's lit up by the last slivers of fading sunlight, and give it a small nod and farewell before heading back home. I wonder what happens if you throw a, blo a block of, like, of the, the bloody salt in there. Somebody gonna find her like, oh my god, there was a murder! What is going on? They turned him to salt! Those bastards! I retrieve the caterpillar from where it's been hiding during the eclipse. It seems to have been dozing, rousing only when I gave it a pat on the back. It takes a few moments to start moving after I clamber onto its back. Bratton wasn't kidding that it's used to the route. It heads straight back into town, scooting across the flesh fields with no hesitation. It's only when we're nearing the park that its pace that its pace slows. No doubt it's waiting for instructions from its rider. I don't want to hand her off to anyone, and I don't want to return her to the Salt Scouts. Bratton wouldn't want them to start questioning me and figure things out. So I end up leaving her tied near the park side entrance. This way somebody will find her tomorrow, but it will preserve the mystery of where her rider went. Just how Bratton would want it. I give the caterpillar a small wave as I leave it behind. It pays me no attention, of course, but that's fine. It's a good beast, and I hope its next rider cares for it as Bratton did. I walk home slowly, feeling the day's exhaustion start to catch up to me. 
Though my delivery route entails a lot more walking than I did today, I feel oddly drained. When I do get home, I collapse in bed and fall into a deep, dark sleep. I dream briefly of sinking into an endless hole, enveloped in a lukewarm fluid. Each breath I exhale escapes in a big bubble that swim upwards out of view. Bratton isn't there, but I dearly wish he, wish he is. I wouldn't want to be alone in that abyss. Bratton is stronger than me. He'd be able to weather, weather that hole by himself, but still. He must feel a little lonely. I snap awake to the buzzing of my alarm beetle. I get dressed, eat some salt, head out to work. I greet my boss good morning. I ask how his eclipse went. He says it went well. He asks how my eclipse went. I smile and say it went fine. I end up keeping that whole secret. I'm not that close to any of the other salt scouts anyway. Nobody comes to question me, so it's easy to keep it a secret. Maybe that's irresponsible. Maybe I should have told everyone as soon as possible so they could study the hole and maybe find Bratton. But I think he would have wanted it this way. He would have wanted to remain an enigma for a little longer before the world rushed to the hole to dissect and unravel its secrets. Man, humanity would have been like, Oh my god, where are all these people coming from? Why are they naked? And then they'd find out that there's another world and things would be crazy. I wonder what happens um, if a human was able to pass through. I suppose they would also change, right? Because if people from here change as they go into the pool then humans would change but then that one's crazy because it's like what are you going to turn into are you going to be a cool alligator or are you going to be something absolutely horrifying and i want to do what bratton would have been happiest with my days end up a little quieter without him my shortcut through the park is almost silent the ambiance of insects and birds chirping interrupted only by my footsteps there's no longer the sound of Bratton's bolt crashing through the underbrush, no boisterous laughter to scare off the crows, no large arm winding around my shoulders to pull me close. Bratton is gone, and I miss him. And sometimes I find myself wondering if I made the right choice. But I try not to dwell on that thought. There's nothing I can do about it after all. All I can do is trust in him, so I do that. I believe in him. I know that someday Bratton will come rushing back, head held high as he tells the world about his discovery. Until then, all I can do is wait. Ugh! No! Maybe that's why I forgot about doing this. Because <laughs> I didn't want to end it with me being sad. I wanted, it, I wanted to end it with me being happy, and I'm with Bratton, and life is relatively good. I get... <laughs> Here we go again. Um, I guess, I feel like when people from our world would go into a fantasy world, it feels a lot, like, better, because in the fantasy world, typically, uh, when I say fantasy, I mean, like, not as developed as ours, it's easier to get around because you don't have to worry about identification, um, you can... If if you can get, like, a better grasp of, like, how things work, you're able to, like, earn money. And if not, like, money directly, you can, like, figure out, like, how to get, um, food by scavenging and stuff like that. If you go into a futuristic world, that's culture shock, too. You become a boomer. <laughs> you're like, I don't know how this works. I don't know, like, what is going on. I can't scavenge for anything because it's all futury and I'm probably in a city and it sucks. <laughs> it's just all around awful. I don't really like modern like settings because I'm just like, I'm already in a modern setting. I don't care. I'll just watch like a movie or something. I don't want to read about this. <laughs> and if it's like futury. It just gets weird, and it makes me feel bad. It usually, because it's, like, dystopian or something, it just, it feels awful. <laughs> I just want to be free. Okay, now I'm done. <laughs> I would have parted this if it had, uh parted well but i think it should be fine if it's like this it's whatever i'm hiding the i'm hiding the naughty bits Ooh. 
Nyarg will be the same way. I don't plan on splitting it because it feels better this way. It just, it's going to be weird if I split it, I feel. This is officially the end, and now I can finally say, well, I said it before, but officially, I'll say it now. <laughs> Have a good day and a good night. I hope to see you in Nyarg's route or in anything else. Bye bye